So today I'm going to talk about scaling experiment design, focusing on my experience of scaling experiment design with a particular platform, Dallinger. And where I'd like to start is with Frederick Bartlett. So in 1932, uh, Frederick Bartlett, um, oh my God, is my camera on? It's not on. Am I here? Uh, I can't see the chat, so I can't confirm. Somebody's gonna say I'm here. Yes, okay, I'm here. Okay, good. Let me just give a refresh. I'll give a nice start from, from scratch now that I'm actually here. Hi, everybody. So where I'd like to start is with Frederick Bartlett's 1932 uh, book, on remembering. And in that book, he described a series of experiments where he asked participants to come into the lab and perform a, a, a kind of technique called serial reproduction. So what does that look like? Well, he would start by giving the, the, the participant a blank sheet of paper with just one image on it, something like this, an Egyptian hieroglyph. And then he would take it away give them a blank piece of paper and, and some writing utensils, and he would ask them to reproduce it verbatim. So just to buy a little time here so that I can make this task appropriately hard for you, I just want to note that whoever create, created this stock photo of a blank piece of paper decided for whatever reason to put um, an iPad pencil in there as though you could write on paper. Okay, so now that I've wasted time, you, you, you now uh, can try to recall what did that original image look like? You try to recall it by writing it down exactly as it was. And then here's the, here's the first participant who did exactly that task and wrote it down. And I think they did a pretty good job. But then here's the key thing. What Bartlett does is he takes away that, that, that the piece of paper, he sends the participant home and brings in a new participant into the lab. And that participant's job is particularly to do the exact same task, but instead of using the original stimulus, they're gonna use the reproduction that the first person did as their stimulus. So they see this, then they get their own blank piece of paper and they're asked to reproduce that verbatim by drawing it exactly, okay? Here's how they do, okay? Not, not terrible, okay? And so this goes on and on and on, uh, fourth participant and so on. And in the end, what you get is what's called a transmission chain. You have a chain of reproductions where each participant is reproducing what the previous one recalled. And so here what you see is that the hieroglyph slowly becomes an image of a cat. Um, and Bartlett's goal was to study social processes and memory. He found that uh, a whole bunch of different effects related to how somebody's culture affects their memory. Uh, typically drawings, he's done with drawings, with stories, with all sorts of different kinds of stimuli. They tend to get um, simpler, more abstract, and they take on properties of the uh, listeners, readers, uh, drawers' own culture. So more generally, this technique is a transmission chain. And the structure of a transmission chain is such that one participant passes information to another down a chain and so on. Um, but this style of experimentation, where uh, one person passes information to another, uh, is, is typical of many different fields. We, we see this in um, social cognition, we see this in experimental economics, uh, we see this in um, studies of social contagion. And uh, with the same basic structure of people passing information from one to the next, but manipulating a lot about the, the network structure, manipulating things about the kinds of, of, of um, processes that play out over that network. What's common to all of these kinds of experiments is that the logistics are complex. Unlike in a uh, brick and mortar lab where, you, where we have you know, fairly set ways of, of, of running experiments and where we're, we're constrained, uh, but we're constrained in, in sample size, but where we have very good techniques for, um, you know, we have par participant pools in the lab, we have you know, st standardized procedures. Um, one of the difficulties of, of running these kinds of transmission chain experiments and social experiments is the logistics. We, what we, in, if we were to do this in the lab, we would need the physical space to isolate participants. We would need to bring them in in this sequential way. And there's, there's constraints that make this quite difficult uh, to do. Um, so one opportunity is to look towards crowdsourcing in order to um, uh, you know, like expand our repertoire and to uh, rely on the fact that over the past, let's at this point, maybe 15 years, uh, experimenters have started to move from brick and mortar labs to uh, the online lab. And that's you know, been accelerated by uh, the past six months or so where 
you know, I, like I, I would imagine that many of you are in the same situation as me where I can't recruit participants in the lab anymore. And so now it's really these crowdsourcing tools that are going to make it actually possible to do to do research um, with, you know, like human subjects research. Okay. And so there's been this movement towards crowdsourcing, but one thing to note is that many of the kinds of experiment designs that people use when they do crowdsourcing, uh, they, they replicate the kinds of designs that we do in the lab. Um, but this is a missed opportunity. There's a whole ecosystem. I just wanted to point out some of the, you know, uh, I've created some crowdsourcing systems, but there's a whole ecosystem and uh, of, of many different people working on these sorts of crowdsourcing tools to, um, to, to allow people to, uh, in general, bring people into an online lab and arrange them into some sort of a network. Uh, in fact, I think among our audience and our, 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 um, our panel speakers, uh, we may have created, I would actually say maybe five to 10 of these systems um, ourselves. Um, and there's also several of them that are kind of one step beyond the cognitive sciences, maybe in something like experimental economics or study of social contagion, which you know, there, there may be some people in the audience who, who study who study that. Actually, I know there are some people in the, in the audience who study that, um, but they're just a little bit a little bit more on the on the periphery of the, of the typical cogsci audience. Um, and then there's 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 platforms like Otri, which are really well used in um, in the social sciences and in, in, in experimental social science. So, our attempt at, at solving this problem or contributing to the solution of this problem was creating Dallinger, and uh, Dallinger is a platform for automating experimental uh, experiments, behavioral and social science experiments, end to end. So, what Dallinger does is it handles end to end recruiting participants from crowdsourcing services like Amazon Mechanical Turk, bringing them into the online lab, arranging them into some sort of a network structure. Um, and then defining the process that determines how they communicate with each other, either simultaneously or in a more intergenerational structure, like in the transmission chain. Um, uh, it then uh, does the standard things like, you know, uh, compensating them, paying them, debriefing them, sending them away. And the key thing that we focused on in building Dallinger is what we might call contingent experiments. Experiments that are like the transmission chain in that the, the key functionality is being able to conditionally recruit participants and to have the task that those participants do depend on the state of the experiment up to then. So the classic example of that is a transmission chain where the only way to have the second participant actually start the experiment is to have the first one finish so that whatever they created, either their drawing or their story, can be the stimulus for the next participant. Um, and if you're gonna run this online, you know, running five or 10 people in a row, maybe you can sit there and do that. But if you wanted to run a 100 person transmission chain, for example, um, it requires new infrastructure. The automation is really what's going to uh, enable that. So uh, the Dallinger platforms allow, allow, uh, allows an experimenter to run many, many of these networks simultaneously for each of them to measure, record, and intervene on the network and to combine people, uh, what I call bionics, which are, we'll just call them combinations of human cognition with also predefined um, uh, aspects of machine intelligence and, uh, and, and also um, boundedly rational agents or just any agent that's purely defined computationally, not uh, a person. And you can mix these together. So for example, you might have a transmission chain where every other participant is actually uh, more or less like a, a, um, like a bot-based confederate that's taking on a particular strategy or biasing memories in a particular way. The general architecture of Dallinger is that uh, the uh, Dallinger web service runs on the cloud, the, uh, the experimenter has a client, a, a Python module, as well as a command line interface that they use to communicate with the web ser uh, server. The web server itself then also communicates directly with the, the human participants, and it also communicates externally to, um, to crowdsourcing services like Mechanical Turk, or if you have your own kind of bot server, um, and, it, and calls out to that to bring everybody into the online uh, lab and to, and to arrange the communication. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to push in building Dallinger is this idea that once you automate experiments and once you define them in code, you can start to think about experiment design as a problem of algorithm design, where rather than relying on a small repertoire of classic measurement techniques and experiment designs, like the initial uh, uh, transmission chain, which has been with us for um, 100 and 20, okay, 100, you know, 100, 
25 years at least, um, you can start to think about what are the dimensions along which you can, you can change that. And, and, and what it, you can start to think about what is the transmission chain in terms of its structure and how can you generalize that and think about new kinds of algorithms that you could write that um, might be better measurement tools for the kinds of things you're looking to measure. Uh, so let's actually just look in particular at what a transmission chain is when you actually think about it as an algorithm. And the key to the transmission chain is uh, two, two features. First, there's a certain network structure inherent in the transmission chain. Um, and that is the, the chain structure. It's that one person follows the next, the next, the next, and each person is connected to just the one person behind them and the one person in front of them. Uh, the second component of it is this process that plays out over the network. It's the rules that define what happens. You could have a chain structure that had any number of different kinds of rules with people passing information back and forth. You know, imagine, imagine we were all standing in a row. We could, we could communicate amongst the, ourselves, you know, just, just communicating with the person to our side in, in many different ways. The transmission chain defines a particular process that plays out over that network. Um, in particular, what it says is that it is, it, it's defined as what happens when a newcomer arrives. It says that really um, there, there's, there's, there's a different way to think about it, which is there's a chain defines the, the way that, new, that participants connect. And then there's a rule for how, how information is passed around when a newcomer joins the network. So in the case of the classic transmission chain, when the newcomer comes, they get added to the end of the chain. The person before them sends information to them and um, they receive it and do what they will with it. Okay. Um, in a, in a kind of different alternative implementation of Dallinger, we actually have boiled and, and kind of reduced the, this, um, this algorithmic uh, thinking uh, down to its essence, where here's actually a Python module uh, called Judicious, where you import it and it has a primitive that is a crowdsourced human decision, just reproducing some text. So this is an analog, a different example of the 1932 uh, experiments from Bartlett's 1932 book, where rather than um, drawing, in this case, he's um, asking participants to recall a story. And uh, here we have the entire transmission chain um, defined in what is essentially a, a for loop that feeds its output back into its input. Uh, that's line eight, where one person reproduces the text that becomes the new text. Okay, so I show you this here not uh, not um, because uh, this is the most important example. This is actually just the, the simplest example, and it starts to show you what you can do when you when you start to think about um, experiment designs like uh, a transmission chain in terms of, of algorithms. You can now start to think about, oh, what are all the different algorithms out there? What are the different algorithms that might be suitable as measurement devices in, in experiments? And thinking about correspondences uh, between what you're trying to, trying to measure and what um, existing algorithms are out there that are, that are good for measuring information in that, in that or, or, or measuring in, the, in problems that have the same structure. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, the, the goal here is really to expand beyond a transmission chain and to think about like, how can we scale that up? How, what happens when we swap in different network structures or different processes that play out over that network? Um, and what I'd like to share is one example of doing that at a kind of, um, at a kind of extreme where what we're doing is really scaling up a transmission chain so that it becomes uh, much more in feel like an agent-based simulation, the, the kinds of agent-based simulations that are used all over the behavioral and social sciences, um, particularly in cases where people want to study behaviors that they can't really capture in, in the lab and where they want to be able to very precisely define uh, behavior. So we can start to think about um, basically interpolating between the common laboratory-based experimental methods that we use, where we have very good access to human behavior, but not very good access to larger scale phenomena that depend on many people or uh, small numbers of people over large amounts of time, interpolating between that and interpolating between agent-based models, where um, these are, you know, algorithms that uh, define uh, behavior very precisely uh, um, and so make very strong assumptions about the underlying behavior. So in, in this set of experiments, which we call evolutionary simulations with people, uh, 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 in collaboration with Tom Morgan at ASU and, and Tom Griffiths, our uh, co-organizer, um, what we're doing is I'm going to start with the basic task that we ask people to do, and then I'm going to describe how we take that common task that's used in, in single uh, person laboratory experiments all the time and really scale that up to something that looks much more like an agent-based simulation. Uh, so here we're using a standard category learning task. There are eight, you might call these amoebas, shapes. Uh, four of them, each row is, uh, is one particular uh, problem. Um, four of them are going to be defined as good and four of them are going to be defined as bad and uh, we don't show the participant this. It's their job to learn which are the good amoebas and which ones are the, the bad amoeba. 
Um, and importantly, we're going to manipulate the difficulty of the learning problem so that in some cases, uh, in the easiest case, like a type one problem, uh, the entire category decision boundary is defined by a single feature. So you can just say blue, good, uh, orange, bad. Uh, but in type two or higher problems, uh, such simple single uh, feature decision boundaries are, are not going to do the trick. Um, in, in some cases, they, those would just give you chance performance. You need to have more complex either rules or associations that um, allow you to categorize the amoeba as being good or bad. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty standard category learning task. And that's the task that we're going to ask participants to do. Um, but really what we're going to be um, studying is uh, a, an evolutionary process where there's an interplay between what needs to be learned and what is stored in the biological case in somebody's uh, genome. And so what we're actually going to do is we're going to create an agent-based simulation and, uh, with people, an evolutionary simulation with people. And it's going to start by we're going to bring in using Dallinger, an entire generation of 40 participants. Uh, actually, it's going to be 60 participants. And each of those participants is going to be assigned an artificial genome that in some way contributes to their learning. And they're also going to get a learning task. They're going to do that learning task over and over, and they're going to try to learn the, the, the category boundary. Um, we do that for each uh, member of the, of the first generation. Importantly, what we then do is we send them all away, Ballinger sends them all away, recruits a new batch of 60 participants, and here's the key, which is they're going to inherit information from the previous generation by passing along those artificial genes that we actually assign to each uh, player, each, each, each participant. Uh, we send, uh, Dowinger sends those 60 away, brings a new set of 60, then sends those 60 away, sends in a, a new set of, uh, brings in a new set of 60, and each generation is in some sense learning something from the previous generation by way of, um, of their genomes, and is also, uh, uh, is also directly learning in the category learning task, okay? So this is, this is, feels like an agent-based simulation now, where in total we have 40 generations, 60 participants per generation, so 2,400 participants in this, in this simulation that feels, it's, people, but it feels very much like an agent-based simulation. And here's the key thing, which is we're going to use that evolutionary simulation with people as a condition, as a single condition in an experiment. And so in figure B, what we're doing is we're plotting the uh, frequency of that fixed allele, the one that, that allows people to actually not need to learn directly, but just kind of know the answer, um, as a function of the generation of the simulation. And we're plotting three separate um, uh, conditions, one where the learning problem is easy, uh, slightly harder, and, and in, even harder than that. Um, and then in, in C, we're separately looking at that, those same simulations and looking at how in the cases of the harder learning problems where there are some um, uh, uh, objects that uh, can be categorized as, as exceptions versus non-exceptions to a, to a fairly simple rule, um, there's a, a different learning trajectory uh, between those two conditions. So the point here is that we've, we've, taken, we've taken a transmission chain and we've expanded it along these kind of two dimensions of, of the underlying structure. We've expanded it along the dimension of um, what is the network structure here, rather than being a chain, it's actually an intergenerational structure. And um, in terms of expanding it along the second kind of dimension of the process that plays out over the network, instead of it being a linear chain, it's now this kind of complex uh, random process where there's intergenerational transfer uh, over and over and over in this discrete way. Uh, we've run the same kind of structure of an experiment in a, in, a, in a different case, one where we're studying social learning. And the point here is not to go in, in detail on the, on the experiment itself, but to think about the structure of, of, of the experiment, where what we're again doing is inserting the entire evolutionary simulation in, as a single condition uh, in an experiment. So here we're, we're running these simulations where, uh, where we're studying social learning and we're allowing people not to learn, not just uh, directly from the world by studying, by, you know, uh, performing a task, but also by observing what other people did when, when they learned uh, the decisions that they made. And so here we're plotting the frequency of social learning as a function of these generations. And wh what I would like to point out is in particular, what we're doing is we're taking that entire evolutionary simulation and we're inserting it as a single condition in um, some, some experiment. Uh, what does that look like in practice? Well, it first involves defining the network structure. Uh, uh, Dallinger has baked into it several uh, Quite a few different net, uh, network structures. In this case, it's a discrete generational network structure where you have a single generation, send them away, bring in a new one, connects to the, to the previous one, a new one connects to the previous one, and so on. 
Um, and you also have to define the process that plays out over the network. And that will be quite specific to whatever you're, you're trying to study. But um, basically, it's defined in terms of the, the network and in terms of the participants that, that are in the network and the information that they're passing from one person to the next. Uh, so once you define that, basically defining the, the process that plays out over the network as an algorithm, um, you're good to go. And Dowlinger will automate the process of uh, carrying out that algorithm. There's a second approach to thinking about experiment design as algorithm design, where rather than thinking about changing the structure of the experiment itself, we think about kind of optimizing what, I, what you might think of as hyperparameters of the experiment. And let me give a very specific example of this. So I think we've all run experiments that, um, in so, that um, have studied some form of decision that a participant needs to make or some kind of judgment that a participant needs to make. And um, we typically don't give them an infinite amount of time to make those judgments. Uh, sometimes those constraints come because, you know, we bring an undergrad into the lab and we say, okay, you're going to do this for 30 minutes. And so uh, if they sit on their phone and take 30 minutes to answer each question, they'll run out of time. And so they won't actually complete the experiment. Um, or it might be in a crowdsourced experiment where you very explicitly have to say, okay, we're going to give participants this amount of time to complete the task. That is a hyperparameter of the experiment design. It's one that you have to make a decision about when you actually run an experiment, um, but typically that's not the focal point of the experiment. You're not actually studying, some people do, but, but most people are not studying in particular the effects of manipulating time on, on decision making. And so one of the things you can do when you start to think about uh, experiment design as algorithm design is to actually make that hyperparameter explicit and to do things like uh, use optimization algorithms to actually optimize uh, your experiment for things like its runtime. So here what I have is an example of inserting an entire um, transmission chain into an optimization algorithm, where what we're telling the optimizer is there's this free parameter time, and here's this objective function that we're going to give you. So maybe the objective, objective function is the runtime of the experiment. Maybe you want to make it go as fast as possible, or maybe you actually want to do something like search to, to maximize the effect size. Or maybe you want to do something that's uh, the opposite of that, where actually you want to find um, a time that invalidates your, your hypothesis. Um, the general idea here is that we can actually take entire experiment designs, because Dallinger is automating them end to end, um, we can actually, and, and expresses them as, in the end, single functions. We can insert them into any algorithm that we wish. And I think many of these actually may be useful on a practical level um, for the purpose of uh, improving uh, uh, experiments, and some of them also may be quite useful theoretically in terms of being able to uh, either control or, uh, or study these kind of parameters that we typically think of as being you know, either nuisance, nuisance parameters or, or free parameters that we either, um, that we kind of worry about if they're, you know, we don't know what these, how, these, how other people might have made the decisions, we know how we, we make the decisions. We can actually be explicit about how we make the decisions and use um, algorithms that might actually help us make the, the right decision there. Okay, I want to turn now to talking about um, scalability of experiment design along um, uh, yet, a, yet another dimension. And this is scalability with respect to recruitment. And I want to try to use this as a, as a, as a way to make a larger point about um, scalability and the way that we think about running uh, online experiments and, and really scaling up our experimental uh, infrastructure. So I'd like to distinguish between two kinds of scalability. One of them is a kind of horizontal scalability where we say how many, you know, we, we have some task that doesn't itself demand more than one person do at a, at a time, but we want to think about how many people can we actually get to do that task. And I think for many of us, Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, other crowdsourcing services like Prolific or volunteer science efforts like Volunteer Science or, or, or Pushkin or the Zooniverse, um, they, they've solved this for us. Um, we're not going to individually be able to do all that much better than a massive platform that can, at our fingertips, give us access to 10,000 participants or, in the case of some of the experiments that, you, that you've seen today, um, uh, millions of participants. Um, so that, that's, that's one kind of scalability that I think it's not solved. Um, in, in particular, there's very hard problems with respect to um, 
to representativeness and how do you actually um, recruit representative samples. Um, and there's, there's organizations like the Psychological Science Accelerator that are really pushing hard on, on thinking about ways to actually achieve that. So I think there's, there's work to be done, but there's a, there's a lot of investment by the research community in solving that problem. Uh, there's another kind of scalability issue, which is simultaneous recruitment. And this is the kind of uh, recruitment that I think because it's so hard, we actually often don't even think about experiments that might benefit from it. And this is how many participants can we get at once to do an experiment? Um, many of the experiment designs we do don't, don't benefit from that, but um, there are many kinds of experiment designs in the behavioral and social sciences where there is a, a lot of they require having more than one person simultaneously interacting. Uh, so examples of that are, for example, studying um, the social contagion on a, on a short time scale or studying um, cooperation or interpersonal coordination. Um, you know, they actually, uh, I, should, I should broaden my perspective a little bit. I bet there actually are many people in the audience that um, study this and you probably, um, you probably run into issues where if you're going to do this in the lab, there's a certain cap to how many people you can you can bring in at once. The best you're going to be able to do is, um, you know, maybe get your entire under intro psych undergrad class of, I don't know, it depends on the school size, but let's say anywhere from uh, 10 to 500 people to all do an experiment together while they're right there in the room. Um, but it's going to be quite hard to ever get um, large group scale um, experiments and be able to do this uh, repeatedly and pushing even higher into like um, uh, like society scale experiments is something that I think many of us, it's not even on the table for, for, for what we study because um, we don't have the infrastructure needed to do that. Um, this is also something that people are pushing hard on um, and it's something that we've explored with, with Dallinger and that um, there's also, uh, there, are, there are many uh, teams working on trying to improve uh, scalability of simultaneous recruitment. Uh, so we've run experiments on, for example, uh, transactive memory where we try to push to toward uh, where we're actually explicitly studying the effects of group size on, on interpersonal memory. Um, and there we're trying to push as hard as we can. This is a, a work led by Vel Gates and we're trying to push on, on larger and larger size uh, group sizes. Um, but even then, um, I don't know of anybody who can reliably recruit um, uh, 512 participants to take place in a networked experiment. Um, typically the kinds of scales that are actually available are anywhere from small groups, say one, uh, two, three, four, five, totally doable, um, to larger scales uh, of, what, of what we see are in the, in the hundreds, uh, where some very particular example I've managed to get uh, uh, several hundred, and then there are kind of rare events where you get uh, like, like a kind of Reddit experiment where you get millions of people, but it's not in a, in a controlled experiment. Okay, the, the kind of broader point that I want to make about this is, um, I think you're gonna hear over the next, yeah, I think you have heard over the past five years or so and will hear over the next several years, people building platforms for doing behavioral and social science. And um, I, I am a culprit in this, but I think um, thinking about them as platforms is a mistake. And the reason for that is, um, I go back to this, this Unix philosophy. The Unix philosophy is a philosophy about how tools ought to be developed. And it says that what tools should be, are they should be small, single purpose and composable. And I think it's the, the same is true of the way that we think about building uh, platforms, where, where um, in the same way that when you hire a carpenter, they don't bring a platform um, to, 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 do the, to do the job, they bring a toolbox. Um, I think we need to think about what are the actual relevant tools that we need, the infrastructure that we need for doing uh, behavioral and social science and doing cognitive science at, at, at scale. Um, and I think those tools, they, they have names, the names are not platforms. They're names like, uh, like a recruitment crowdsourcing service or they're a tool like, um, like, uh, like a, a task, uh, uh, an implementation of a particular task. And I think by, uh, by um, thinking about it in that way and thinking about the different um, tools that, uh, that make up this kind of ecosystem of doing virtual lab experiments and online experiments and scaling up cognitive science, uh, we'll be able to make a lot more progress because we'll be able to make smaller tools that are interoperable so that what the work we do on Dallinger can benefit, for example, the work that Josh does on, on Pushkin or the work that uh, the volunteer science team does on volunteer science or all of, the, all of this, these members of our, our community. Um, Dallinger is open source software. It's available on uh, GitHub. Um, there's extensive documentation. Um, just as a warning to try to give you a sense of what it's like to learn one of these platforms, um, you should think about it not as simple as like, uh, you're just gonna go like click install the software and be running an experiment within 15 minutes. 
Um, but it's also not the kind of thing that you necessarily need to spend six months training in, like as though you were doing uh, fMRI experiments the first time. Uh, we've, we've successfully run um, uh, training sessions for Dallinger, and I know that other teams building um, uh, virtual lab experiment software uh, and, and crowdsourcing software have also managed to run workshops where the kind of investment that you need is you definitely need a few days to get the layout of the of the system, and then you should be thinking about you know like you could you could probably build build an experiment on the scale of weeks. The major benefit is that once you put in the work and you've and you've defined the experiment, you can really run many uh, iterations on, on these experiments uh, very quickly. So that unlike in the lab in lab case where you know running some of the experiments that people have run using Dallinger in the lab, we estimate that they would take anywhere between nine months to an infinite amount of time in the sense that one could just never recruit that that many participants in the lab. Um, and you know it took us quite a while to write the the initial implementation of those experiments. But once you do that, uh, we can we can run these once per day. And you can start to think about composing them and actually building upon these these definitions to create richer and richer uh, experiment designs and a bigger and bigger ecosystem. That means that a newcomer can uh, start with a, a demo and 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 run from there. Uh, one last note. Uh, on, on sustainability, uh, we've been going strong for several years. Uh, Dallinger's predecessor started in, in uh, about 2015, uh, and we've had pretty steady contributions from a wide group of fellows. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank all of them uh, who have contributed to it. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.